Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. The silver bullet, the saving grace, the one and only, the Lord and Savior for our current economic crisis. According to the liberal thinking individuals are, drum roll please. IMF, the IMF. The International Monetary Agencies. The International Monetary Fund or the IMF. As soon as we go there, we will see the beginning of the renaissance of our economy. Meaning it'll be the beginning of our golden years, right? According to the data provided on the official website of the International Monetary Fund, Sri Lanka has received assistance from the IMF 16 times totaling to over 4.4 billion SDRs. We went to the IMF 16 times and the IMF failed 16 times to fix our economic problems? Is that what you're telling me? So the 17th time is a charm. This is when all the issues pertaining to Sri Lanka's economy will be fixed. Why? Because IMF has come across a magical potion that once we drink the Kool-Aid, voila, everything is fixed. I mean for a moment, think rationally. If you are sick, you have an issue with your heart, you go to a doctor to get it fixed. You go the first time, no result. The second time, no result. You're still sick, feeling awful, and it doesn't seem like your health is improving whatsoever. What do you do? Go to someone else to get it fixed, right? You're not going to go to that same person 16 times to, uh, to the same doctor thinking, oh no, you are my hope. You will ask him to fly a kite and seek assistance at a place where you will get your problems fixed. If that's something we will do regarding our lives, why the heck do we go to an institution that has failed us 16 times? Now, the narrative is not that the IMF is going to fix everything. The actual narrative, all these uh, liberal self-proclaimed economic gurus are hiding from you, is that the IMF failed 16 times. IMF for Sri Lanka is the ultimate failure for our economic problems and mind you when we say that all those economic pundits will cunningly shrewdly will make sure that they put the blame on ourselves that we couldn't do it that's why we failed it's not the IMF. Now to understand the IMF and why it exists you need to go back in history and understand the context as as why it was created. And during the First and Second World Wars, countries in the West were heavily invested in the military, hoping that their strength and power would win the wars at hand. So what did they do? Well, they put their best resources right at the front of the battle. People. So when over 300 million people were brought into the front lines by their respective governments to fight the war under the guise that if they win the war, prosperity awaits. Now, soon after the world wars ended, many countries were left with a massive number of soldiers and also companies who suddenly found themselves with no purpose. Companies that created war equipment found themselves and their products redundant and with no market to sell. So was the people. They didn't know what else to do, where to turn to. To solve this crisis, countries like the United States took a diligent step to convert these people and companies to production houses that would rebuild their economies. Kellogg's is a good example. During the war, it fed soldiers and soon after converted to a cereal company that produced a breakfast meal. General Motors, another good example. GM was a company that uh, made weapons and armed, ve uh, armed vehicles during the war. Soon after, Bang! Converted to an automaker that produces cars for everyday use. And also Lockheed Martin, the company that had missiles and aircrafts for the war, started to switch to passenger aircraft and combat aircraft once the war ended. The American government achieved this by providing these companies with government subsidies during the wartime, hoping to provide America with ways and means to win the war, basically becoming super companies with optimal output. With this switch, these companies were producing at a record pace within a few years. They managed to capture the whole of their American market, meaning they had met the de uh, demand domestically. Now, as the production market grew in America, American businesses found that uh, well, they, they were producing higher than the demand, resulting in a massive surplus. 
Now, the American government had to figure out where the surplus would go. Only several Western countries wanted what America was producing, and they too were doing the same thing. So, those markets were not much of a use for America. America wanted new markets around the world to access, to sell their products. This is where the idea for organizations like the World Bank and the IMF came to life. Initially, it was called uh, Bretton Wood Institutions. The Bretton Wood Institutions are a combination of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. They were combined. That's how it was created. They were uh, set up at a meeting of 43 countries in Bretton Wood, New Hampshire in uh, the USA in July of 1944. Uh, the Second World War ended somewhere around 1945. The aim was to help rebuild shattered post-war economy and promote international economic cooperation. That is very vital here. In translation, they were tasked with going and finding new markets around the world and making them accessible for American products. Now this has been going on for some time and America, by ways and means of politics, economically, financially and in some instances militarily, captured the world markets little by little. The ones that mattered to them, they kept them under their thumb, and those who didn't, discarded to the dumps. Now in comes China, Russia, doing their own little thing. Little by little, capturing markets that were vulnerable, uh, valuable to America and becoming a threat to their businesses, their way of life. The best joke about this is that China and Russia is now using the same ethos, rules, regulations and measures set forth by the United States of America. They are winning the game on America's own turf. This is where the economic cold war between the United States, China and Russia comes to play. Sri Lanka too fell for this in 1977 with uh, President Jayarajana opening Sri Lanka's economy. This garnered him a state visit to the United States of America. I think that is the only state which is visit by a, a Sri Lankan leader thus far. Former US uh, President Ronald Reagan hailed him as a true friend. Why? Well, we opened our economy to cater to the needs of America, thus becoming another part of the Western world. and a country which the United States is proud to count among its friends. Mr. President and Mrs. Jai Wadini, welcome to America. I believe your people and their children will reap rewards for many years to come, thanks to the bold economic steps that you've taken. Now Sri Lanka is open for America to take a dump anytime they please. In comes the Rajapaksa government in 2005. President Mahindra Rajapaksa had a different vision for this nation. He was tired of being an import-dependent economy. So slowly but surely, he started to put the building blocks of transforming our import-oriented economy into a production-based economy. So we could take control of our country's narrative rather than be a pawn in the global economic warfare. We saw President Mahindra Rajapaksa retaking certain national assets uh, that were privatized back into the government's portfolio. That's why we saw the president taking steps to tell no to the IMF program and started to apply homegrown solutions. I know, homegrown solutions are kryptonite to individuals like Dr. Harsha de Silva. Even the uh, former central bank deputy governor uh, Nandalal Virasinghe and a whole plethora of other liberal economists in Sri Lanka. Pfft, they can't come up with anything. The Sri Lankans, we are slaves. How dare they think? We should just be loyal to our masters out there in the West and kiss their feet and make sure we continue to be loyal slaves. I wonder what kind of pep talk these individuals give their own children. Anyhow, getting back to the whole story, we were doing pretty good. Our solutions uh, were paying dividends and things were on track. President Mahindra Rajapaksa aligned 
our allegiance to China and India. After all, they are the success stories in our part of the world. And if by any chance we want to stand on our own two feet, we got to look at what our own neighbors did and do the same thing. So naturally, this rang alarm bells in America and the West. A slave is attempting to rise. But Mahesh, if you are saying that the US wants to dominate Sri Lanka and the Sri Lankan market and not allow China to infiltrate, then from the onset we should have big American businesses here in Sri Lanka. But our biggest importers are China and India. So your, your argument doesn't make sense, right? Well, the thing is this. Of course, the Sri Lankan market is a sad joke for America and the West. Our buying power is pathetic. Our market share is pathetic. And everything is minuscule. Even our brains are at some times. But it's not about the market share that America is worried about here in Sri Lanka. There's a global war on trade and commerce, politics and everything between China, America and Russia. All three giants wants to be the global leader as per predictions uh, by many think tanks. Now, global pundits are also calling, um, along with all the jacks of, uh, jack of all trades, that China will overtake America as a superpower in the world in the near future. Now, how can you be a superpower when you don't have the most amount of countries bowing and worshipping to you? That's where Sri Lanka, the slave, comes in. We all know that the United States of America under former President Barack Obama, his then uh, Vice President and current clueless leader of the free world, Joe Biden, and supported by a colossally failed presidential candidate Hillary Clinton, played a pivotal role in getting rid of President Mahindra Rajapaksa by fueling fake allegations and animosity amid Sri Lankans through their liberal agents in Sri Lanka like the UNP, mainly because President Mahindra Rajapaksa was getting Sri Lanka to stand in our own two feet politically and economically, even militarily. We were a nation that defeated terrorists and proved the West wrong. We were a nation that was taking our economy back, despite doom and gloom predicted by organizations like the IMF and the World Bank. We were a nation that was trying to take control of our narrative. And that, my friend, cannot happen at any cost for America and the rest of the West. Because if one slave gets up, the rest will follow suit. And anarchy will occur. In the end, America will no longer have their dominance over anything. That needs to be stopped at any cost. So they got rid of President Mahindra Rajapaksa and installed the clown of all presidents, Mantripala Sirusena, who brought the Western drums back into Sri Lanka and started to bang them just the way they wanted. Such organizations like the IMF, which uh, failed 15 times prior, came back to give advice for the 16th time under the Yahapalian joke from 2016 to 2019 and started to steer the economy back to the depths and beyond. From a growth of around 5.5% in 2015 to less than 3% in 2019. Who were the traitors of that genius plan to make our country once again fall flat on our face and worship the Western masters? Well, individuals like uh, former Prime Minister Ronnie Wickremesinghe, and Dr. Harsha De Silva, Iran Vikramaratna, later Minister Mangala Samarweva, and the so-called economic gurus, all of them calculated and came and did what they had to do. They are the ones that have been pushing for this. If you look at all their YouTube videos, interviews, and any forum they speak, some are very tactful to say directly um, that they are not alluding to asking the Sri Lanka to go to IMF. But that's exactly what they're saying. We even heard uh, that one such individual gave his opinion directly to the finance minister. Indeed, Sri Lanka will again fall flat on our face if we look at the IMF as our Lord and Savior. And when they do, the same thing that happened to the Yahapalne government at the end of 2019 will occur. This government will too have to pack up their bags and go home. Uh, joining me now from the data wall is Aun Danidu Tanamasan. Uh, you've studied the IMF uh, uh, recommendations, Danidu, uh, from the last time they were here, from uh, I think 2016 to 2019. You've learned that how their projections and uh, consultation resulted in a destructive path of our economy. Mm, we were forced to take that uh, path. Uh, is that a correct sentiment, Danidu? 
Yes, Mahesh, that sentiment is very much correct. And we are going to look at a few metrics as to why we say that. Because the facts seem to be depicting a different picture when looking at the general IMF conversation. We are going to look at a few key areas. Now, we would expect when the IMF was there within Sri Lanka, which, was, which is what happened during the Hapalne time period, that the reserve situation would have very soon. Because reserves is a much token of topic these days. But the blue line represents where IMF thought the reserve situation within the country would have gone to. But this, the line below, is where it actually was. Now, taking the same sentiment forward, the debt situation. Mahesh, you have covered this very much within this program as well. The debt almost doubled during the Hapalne time period. We see that specific access going up so high, with the IMF not even coming close to projecting that the debt situation would go that high. Same sentiment when it comes to the debt in comparison to the GDP, as a percentage of the GDP skyrocketing effect of debt we, we witness, which, which the IMF has made no account for. Now, that is very specifically a dangerous situation, but that is not all, Mahesh. When taking that same thought process forward, we would expect when the IMF is here that the production aspect, the manufacturing aspect, the country would have grown in its GDP, would have had more potential. That is what we would expect. That is what the IMF also would have expected, but that is not what happened in reality, given the fact that the GDP of the country also dropped a very dangerous situation. Mahesh, I believe these are some things that we should bear in mind when talking about going back to the IMF. Over to you, Mahesh. Indeed, a lot of data there uh, that pretty much explains exactly what happened uh, when the IMF was last uh, here, 2016 uh, to 2019. Uh, one thing that people really need to understand is that even though they, call, uh, they, they say that you know, we, they are the solution, it's not. Dani Duitana was some at the data wall. Thank you very much. Now, one of the biggest arguments that have been floated by the liberal clan is that, well, if you go to the IMF, it would boost investor confidence around the world because investors would think that for some reason, if IMF is around, everything is fine. How? How? I mean, how? Think logically. Suppose there is an investor who sees a potential market in Sri Lanka. What key things would he factor in before beginning a business here? What would he get back? Will he have a higher profit margin? Is it beneficial for his company by coming into Sri Lanka? Can he actually impact his bottom line by investing here? So before he's investing, he would do the necessary study, the groundwork, about our nation, our laws, our society, our business environment, and of course, the political situation and economic history. When he finds out that apparently we went to the IMF because you only go to the IMF when your economy is fudged up, and, and by that we've gone 16 times for that matter, how the heck is that going to build any confidence amongst any investor? These are the lies told by ardent bookworms who read a good book on economic theories and then flouts it to a nation in peril and sells it and themselves as the only solution. No, what they say is not the only solution. There are better solutions for Sri Lanka. We just need to be sensible enough. Our political leadership needs to be sensible enough in order to take a look at them based on rational thinking rather than fear. We will take a small break upon our return, more to reveal why this is the wrong choice to proceed with. We'll be right back.